Great. So welcome, everybody, to this morning's event um, from the SILIP Information Literacy Group. We are very happy to have you here today on a Monday morning. I know uh, a bit early for some, um, but yeah, we have got a great day today. We've got some brilliant speakers. Um, we're going to talk about, about game-based learning for information literacy teaching. So we've got Sarah Pavey. Andrew Walsh and Rosie Jones, who are going to share some of their experiences and their wisdom and knowledge. Um, I'm hoping for an exciting session. Obviously, I know Andy's going to be planning something, uh, so that's good. So um, just a few things. So as Kat said, we are recording the session today. Um, so if you don't want to be captured um, on your with your video, please do turn your camera off. During the sessions when the um, uh, the presenters are speaking if you could just keep it on mute until we actually do have some questions and um, just so it doesn't distract the, the presenters we've got time for questions after each of the sessions and we've also got a discussion um, element as well through the uh, throughout the day if I'm just going to put that up there so everyone can see um, this is the programme for today. So we've had a bit of a pre-session, just chatting, getting to know each other. And then we've got um, this opening introductions that I'm doing now. And then we'll have Sarah, who's first up, um, talking to us about using games and gamification to explain information literacy concepts for research projects. Um, we're then going to have just a five minute comfort break. So if you just need to go to the toilet or just step up, stretch, whatever, that's absolutely fine. And um, we're going to have that. And then at 11.55, we'll have Rosie talking to us about a playful journey. We'll then have a slightly longer 10 minute tea break where you can go off and um, make some uh, make a cup of tea. And then we'll have um, Andy talking to us about practical library play. And then at 12.35, we do have some time for discussions and questions and a roundup. So feel free to, um, to get involved in that. And then again, at the end, um, if people can stay and they, they're around, we've got a bit of a post session networking as well if people want to chat and, and ask anything as well. So hopefully that's, um, that's all great. And hopefully people are able to um, get involved in all of that. We do have a hashtag that's on the uh, screen as well today. Um, so it's hashtag ILGGBL2022. It's going to going, that's that's going to um, tickle me for a while, Andy, with your 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 comment earlier. That uh, it looked like the cat had walked across the um, the keyboard. He said because of the the, <laughs> the blurb. But anyway, so um, we will should make a start. Um, uh, any questions or any problems anybody's got, please do put them in the chat. Kat and I will um, will respond to them. Same for presenters. If you've got any issues, just let us know um, and we will get started. So I shall hand over to Sarah. I shall stop sharing now and um, let Sarah stop. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to start sharing my screen, which I hope is going to work. And uh, yeah. Hopefully that's looking like it's up there. It's looking like it's there on my screen. I hope it's all right on everybody else's screen. Um, but yes, a windy and rather damp morning here in Epsom in Surrey, where I'm based. Um, and I hope you're going to enjoy this session. I know looking at the people that have joined that most of you are probably in higher education rather than schools. But I'm hoping that my talk, although it's focus slightly on schools, um, it's going to contain some useful information um, about the, the undergraduates that maybe come to your institution, or maybe if we're in a college, the people that are coming there to do their sixth form studies as well. So I think there'll be something for everybody. And even though I'm looking at schools and how you would teach research elements to schools through the idea of game-based um, learning and gamification, I think that um, these could be applicable to any age group. So you could use it for students, you could also use it for adult education as well. I think a lot of it is very much the same. So what I'm hoping to do, and this is interesting because I'm having the same problem that I had on Saturday, whereby my, my advanced thing is not working and I don't know because it was in the demo, but still, there we go. Um, so what I'm going to hopefully um, get over to you is really why this approach to learning can be successful, particularly if you're doing independent learning and research type topics. 
it's secondly um, I'm really interested in the way that game-based learning particularly can be motivational I think that that's true for for gamification as well but certainly in game-based learning it can be and lastly because it would be a really boring talk if it was all about theory so we I'm going to show you some practical approaches that I've made and I'm also going to get you to do a few simple games as well so that uh, everybody's brain doesn't go to sleep over the next next 50 minutes or so. So what I'm going to do is say is if you've got any questions, please, if you could just keep those to the end and hopefully following my talk, we can all have a really good discussion about some of the things that you've heard and seen. I really wanted to start off um, by explaining a little bit about the school environment because people may not all be that are here today may not all be familiar with that and I would say that given the the curriculum as it stands at the moment there are fairly few and far between opportunities for what we would call independent learning that's research based uh, an awful lot of what they learn in schools these days is rote learning for tests and I'll come on to that again in a minute. So where are we looking that we could actually apply this sort of pedagogy? Well, certainly in primary schools and when we say key stage two, we're looking at students that are aged between seven and 11 years old because it's at that point that they really begin to understand looking for information and applying it to what they're doing. Before that, it's a bit ethereal and there's lots of questioning and things which I think they should carry through to, to later years, but they don't seem to do that particularly. And then we're looking at secondary school, but these are younger students aged between about 11 and 13 years old. And this is key stage three. And if you've got a teacher who doesn't mind doing this type of learning, then they will have the opportunity to do some research projects at this stage. The problem is after 13 that we start kicking in with the exam curriculum, which starts really from 14 up to 16 for our GCSEs. And then when it comes to A-levels, you're looking at 16 to 18 year olds. And the focus there is very much on exams. If your school offers project-based learning opportunities, such as the higher project qualification, which comes in at GCSE stage, um, so that's sort of for 14, 15 year olds uh, or the EPQ, which would be introduced at sixth form level. And I know that if you work in higher education, many of your outreach departments, perhaps some of your libraries offer opportunities for school children to come in and, and learn about preparing for an extended project qualification within a university environment and using some of your resources and I think that's that's really great that we've got that kind of liaison. Um, if you are in a school that follows the international baccalaureate well then things are very different because that's very much based around um, independent learning and project work and that you build up your knowledge through doing. One of the the issues is, you know, this kind of structure of the, the way in which learning happens in a school can be quite restrictive um, in terms of how we can then introduce information literacy um, context. And when we're looking at the, the most usual approach in a, in a maintained state school in England, it is very much this behaviourist model of rote learning, rote learning for tests. And I would argue that since COVID, it's probably got even more so because they've introduced the catch up curriculum and the focus is on core subjects, getting through those exams at the end of the day. I think it's hugely disappointing that they haven't used COVID as an excuse to revisit how um, we expect school children to learn because it was a golden opportunity to do something different, but they didn't. They just stuck to the exam, the rigid exam structure, and now that's become even more so. So what happened was in 2014, they changed the curriculum and they took away all the coursework 
and um, well, they took away the coursework earlier and then they took away the controlled assessment, which was where you could go and do sort of coursework, but under exam conditions. And they took all of that away. Now, you know, that's eight, 10 years ago now that that's happened. And one of the problems is that if you go to teach a training college, they are teaching teachers to teach to that behaviorist model. And so the difficulty is that now the younger teachers are not used to doing independent learning. What they're used to doing is managing behavior and managing you to get through the test according to a, a set of pre um, prescribed answers. And this is where I think when we're looking at um, game based learning and gamification, this is where that division happens because there's a difference. Gamification is where you get points for completing a level or for doing something, reaching a, a certain um, um, number of, of tasks that you've done or something like that. So it's a reward for the end product. And that was very much um, based on Pavlov's idea where dogs, you know, got a reward if they, they completed a particular task. It's, it's like that. And that's very much the way most of the curriculum is seen, certainly once they get to secondary school. And the teachers are conditioned to that. So why would you as a teacher take the risk to do something a bit more adventurous if you are going to be assessed yourself on how well you get people through those exams? So gamification might be more appropriate when we get in, when we look at things in that context. However, as librarians and information workers, what we really want is this constructivism. We really want people to learn through doing. And this is something which was um, put forward by Piaget and Vygotsky and really looking at how you can motivate people and get them to really take on board tasks um, involving concepts so that you understand the underlying principles of the learning and you can apply that learning in practice. And that's something which I think game-based learning really does. If we go right back to the ancient world, they used to practice for battles by playing strategic games. This is where uh, games like chess come from. You know, it's, it's not something that's just been dreamed up in the last couple of decades. It's been around for an awfully long time. And this sort of constructivism where you can immerse people in that learning I think is really important, but it's not something that comes easy to a school teacher these days or indeed to the student. And this affects their motivation because if we look at how people learn over time, you know, if you introduce something like a project to students, you kind of get this, this reaction to a lot of them. They start off really enthusiastically. Oh, it's something new. It's something I can do. It's a bit like learning a musical instrument. You think, wow, this is going to be great. And then as time sort of ticks on, you suddenly realise, oh, actually, I've got to do some work. And some students, you know, they, they just never get motivated at all. They, they want rote learning. They don't, they don't even engage with the, the project at the start. So because that is not something, it's out of their comfort zone, it's not something they're used to. And maybe it's the teacher even introducing project work in a very sort of understated way because they don't understand how to do it either. And this is where that if we're going to introduce game based learning, sometimes before that sort of initial enthusiasm starts to wane, if we can actually put in a game based learning solution there, then maybe we'll even motivate some of these people down on the green line and move them up. But maybe we can inject something new. It's a great way of being able to understand something that's quite complex or something you've not come across before. We all know that there's an old adage that says practice makes perfect. And it's been shown that, you know, people who go on to be virtuoso music musicians are the people who've put in the most hours of practice. If you want to join a, a sports team, this is why people often who are older in their year group 
um, do better in sports because they've had another sort of 11 months of growing ahead of muscle and things ahead of either the people that are younger in the year group. So they tend to get picked for the sports team. So, so you know, and therefore they get more practice and so on. So, you know, practice is important and this is where it's important for game-based learning gives people an opportunity to do some practice, to get their heads around the concepts that they're going to need. And they are going to need some concepts when it comes to information literacy and project work, because these are the areas I'm going to show you now where if you work in a school, you're probably as a librarian going to have more involvement and possible opportunities to take this pedagogical approach. So it might be to do with finding information. It might be to do with evaluating information. It might be to do with referencing and citation, learning about that. And it might be about putting your piece of work together because it's about the journey that you do, that um, game-based learning is about. It's about the process, not the end product. And it's also, this is something which you're not going to get marks for. Even if you do an EPQ, there's very few marks in terms of the process. It's mostly for the end product. So what we're trying to do by, uh, by putting in some game-based learning, we're trying to give people practice at these skills in the hope that it makes it easier to understand, in the hope that it makes it more enjoyable, but also being aware that at the end of the day, the, the actual mark scheme, the gamification of the side of it, is probably going to take precedence over the journey. However, and again, working in higher education or in adult education, we know that these aspects are so important for information literacy competencies for life, not just here. And certainly when you go to university, this is the kind of approach that you will probably need to take. So it's important that we give school students the opportunities to practice this. I think the, the danger is that, you know, they practice a lot at primary school and then as soon as they get to secondary school, it'll out the window so you know we need to find easy ways to get niches in here so i'm going to go through these four areas and first of all i've got some ideas up here that i've used um, in terms of um, finding information what can we do to find information one of the issues we have with school children is that their vocabulary is fairly limited and this is something which has been identified as an ongoing um, problem and you know it's getting worse i mean if i said to you um, a common object such as a spoon and said could you make that definition a bit more specific you'd probably come up with all sorts of different types of spoon you know it might be a teaspoon it might be a dessert spoon it might be a tablespoon and if you were doing your early literature, you might have a runcible spoon or something like that. Today's students, quite often, if you ask them to do an exercise like that, they'll just say, well, it's a spoon. They, they won't go any further than that. So to find information, whether that's online or whether that is um, on the shelves in print form, you've got to actually engage with vocabulary. You've got to expand that knowledge. So one of the games I quite often play with people is this um, based on the Richard and Judy, you say we pay game. And what I have is a, a student with their back to a screen, which is showing a picture and a word. So it might be something really easy, like say picture of a tiger. And then the rest of the class can see the picture and they can see the word and they have to call out. Um, they're not allowed to use the word that's on the screen, but they can call out other things to give the person with their back to the screen clues as to what might be there. And you just write down all these words on a board. And then after a while, you'll ask the person with their back to the screen who's pretending to be the Internet to see if they can guess what it is. And we start off with something easy like tiger, which is a straightforward word. Then I might choose something like, um, I don't know, black flowers or something like that, which means that 
you've got to look at black separately from flowers and give clues to both of those in order to put them together and find what you're looking for. Then I would move on to something which was a bit more conceptual, something like success. So if you use success as a word, you know, or gentleman, something like that, so that people have different ideas about what that might be, depending on their circumstances. And that gives clues as to how you look for that sort of information, um, whether in print form or on the internet. And finally, I'd use a word like resistance, which has got multiple meanings, and you would um, need to sort of key, well, choose your keywords in your vocabulary that was more specific so that you could get to exactly the meaning that you wanted. So that's an idea. Hierarchy, I use these stacking dolls, the Russian stacking dolls, and you can put sticky notes or write on them and you can have hierarchy within each one so that you can spread it out and you can see how it goes from a big concept down to something smaller. And you can do that again as gameplay within, within small groups. They can work something out. You can give them a word and they could use that. The funny little sphere things that you can see up there on the top left are some um, things that I used for showing the complexity of finding information. And in them, they've got six um, little rings, tags with letters written on them. And you've got to shake them about and you've got to find the, the letters and write those down. And then you unscramble the letters and they make a phrase like find me um, my idea and they can put them together to how you would go about looking for information. So that's the spheres there. Um, there's also a Dewey game that I play the Tower of Information with them and um, I get them all to pretend that they're in a, an information tower. Each um, level of Dewey represents a, a, a level in the tower block. Reception 000 is down at the bottom. That's where you go to ask for your information in an encyclopedia or a reference book. And then you go up through the Dewey numbers on the tower. And I get them to all stand up there with silly notices in front of them, like the 100s person is in charge of the floor that says head in the clouds, always daydreaming and things like that. And you, you just go up through the levels. But again, you can make it into a physical game where they're standing there and somebody can come and ask for information and be directed to the right floor and so on. Over on the bottom left, we've got a couple of digital games, which I think are really good. They, they're basically a scavenger hunt. The one with the little feet on it, the yellow one there, the orangey yellow one, is Goose Chase. And you can set up lots and lots of, of um, little games to play inside or outside your library environment. It could be around outside the um, school, university, college or whatever they could, or library, and they can go around and try and find the clues. And SEPO is very similar. So they're, they're things that you can play on your smart device and um, do the challenges. But one of the things about um, when it comes to finding information um, is that, you know, you, you might, um, sort of school children are very good because they're used to that rote learning of just saying, oh yeah, done that. And, you know, they come up with the first thing they can think of and think, oh, well, that will get a mark. So that's enough. I don't need to do any more. And so one of the games I quite often play with them is something like Spot the Difference, where I've got two um, pictures that are similar and they've got to kind of go through it and see how many differences they get. And of course, the longer they look at it, the, the more things they might see. So using that principle, because in case anybody's nodded off, we're going to play a very quick game here. And what I'd like you to do is to write in chat, as soon as you see this, how many squares you think there are in this diagram. So either that or you can unmute and shout out if you can't do chat, but type away in chat, how many squares do you think there are? Oh, who got 31? I missed that one. <laughs> Whoever that was that got 31. Yeah, well done. That was <laughs> um, so, yeah. So if you look at it, and I mean, I'm not spending too much time on these games, but if you look at it, yes, you've got the 4x4 four four making 16, but you've also got the large square round the outside as well. And then you've got the squares inside the squares. So you've got the ones that have got four, 
in them and these are going across so you've got four there you've got four but you've got the four in the middle and you've got the one in the middle there and so on and then you've got the three by threes as well so all together there are 30 actually <laughs> so, so 30 i don't know where 31 came from that's interesting but there, there are about 30 altogether in there so the more you look the, the more you know you see and the good thing about this is that it just shows them i relate this to marks because you know that gamification which they're so used to i say well you know if you stick with the task you know you're going to get more marks you're going to find more squares so you know a quick game very easy to play and i always get the person that thinks they know the answer to come up and demonstrate it on the board in case they're cheating so let's move on to games for evaluation. Well, these are some of the stuff I do on here. One of the easiest games you can play is dividing people up into little groups of three and you play two truths and a lie. And you could do that about, um, you know, their background or their favourite subject or something like that. And they can say two things that are true and one thing that's a lie. And the other two people have to try and guess which one is true which ones are true and which one is the lie by questioning and this gets them into the idea of asking questions and the right sort of question in order to get the answer so oh yeah you're right square oh okay i'll, I'll take that it's word square as well <laughs> that's a, that's relating to the last one well done rosie <laughs> um so there we go um so you know two truths and a lie because questioning when you're doing evaluation is really important and students are not very good at actually um understanding the the sorts of questions they should be asking because <clears throat> and there's lots of theory behind this as well they don't actually practice doing questioning at home anymore. So many students grow up in front of a screen or that the information is just given to them. And the, the idea of practicing finding out is quite difficult. So you don't learn to ask questions. You do at primary school, that's encouraged, but only up to the age of about seven. And after that, I'm afraid questioning you know, isn't really encouraged because you have to have the right answer. So this open-ended questioning can be quite difficult for students. And another game we can play that focuses on this is a Jeopardy game, whereby you have a, a, a screen with the answers and the person has to select an answer and ask the question that would give that answer. So it's like back to front, really. And that game works really, really well. Other ideas that I've done are things like providing a strange object. You can see the one there in the centre of the screen. I mean, if anybody would like to hazard a guess while I'm, I'm doing this as to what that strange object might be, it's not an instrument of torture. I'll just point that out. But uh, there it is. And, you know, you can give this to people um, to have a look at or if you've got something um, tangible, you know, you can hand it round and get them to, to ask questions about it. And what you do is they ask questions. They might say, how much does it cost? Or, um, you know, how old is it? Or something like that. And then you take each question. So for something like, how much does it cost? And you say, well, who would be interested in knowing the answer to that? So by doing that and finding out who it's for, it's that's quite interesting because that's the sort of question you need to know when you're reading a piece of evidence because you need to know about the bias in it so this starts us off down the road of uh, evaluation by asking questions and wanting to know who would want to know the answer to that now the funny little cube that we've got up there next to it which looks like it's got qr codes all over it it's called a merge cube and this is, I think, one of the most interesting pieces of technology. You basically, you can go to the site for Merge Cube or Object Finder and you can make your own 3D object and connect that to the cube. And then somebody wearing some 3D goggles can actually hold the cube in their hand, which becomes the 3D object that you've designed. And you can move the cube around and look all around it and it will actually feel like you've got that object in your hand. Now, what I really like about Merge Cube is the fact that you can create the 3D objects. So that gives another aspect to this game 
to um, to the students. So what if you created a mystery object and then people had to find and feel it and see what it was and ask questions about it? Another way to do that questioning and that inquiry is to set up something like a, a murder mystery in, in, the, in the school. I set up a live Cluedo game where I had students um, rushing around and chasing teachers all over the place to ask questions and the teachers each had a clue but they also had questions. You could link those to information literacy type questions and you could do it within a class during a session if you wanted to. So if anybody got the question right they would be shown one of the clues for Cluedo that they could cross off their list and eventually you get to a winner. I know Andy, uh, I mean, I have to say that Andy Walsh probably put me onto the idea of, of locked rooms and locked chests and things like that many years ago at Lilac. And um, again, it's something that you can use for evaluation. You can use it for taking people through information literacy concepts. And again, I like the idea that you can do this as a group because it can then be that social interactive type exercise. So I'm just going to show you one of the clues. Oh, by the way, before we move on, nobody got the answer to the strange object. It is, of course, um, found in a greengrocer's shop because it is an asparagus bunching machine, um, which um, so you put it in the machine to stop the asparagus stems from um, getting bruised. Uh, I, I bet you can still find them in Waitrose, probably, or somewhere like that. So um, I'm going to take us back to the locked room scenario and I'm going to give you another little game now which is about evaluation which I put in it. The whole locked room was about, locked chest, was about inventors and they found out that the inventor's name was Mary but then they had to decide what Mary did, what was her invention. So let's um, have a look at the three possible answers here and I'd like you to put in chat whether you think uh, the correct answer is A, B or C. If they found the correct answer, then what they had was like a little template that they could place over one of these strips of paper and it would expose the date, which was the code they needed to open the next layer of the box. So would anybody like to read those and see which one you think? I think somebody may not be muted because there's some hissing going on. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we're going for C. There's lots of C's. Oh, someone's gone for A. Yeah. <laughs> if you've chosen one, you can also put in why you chose that one, why you think it's the most most thing, or you can unmute if you like and tell me why you think that's the most um, important one. Maybe I'll pick on Rosie because I know she's got an unmute button. Do you, want to, do you want to explain why you went for C, Rosie? There's absolutely no rationale to it. I quite like the story was the, the most interesting story for me. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's evaluative, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Would anybody else like to tell me why they think A might not be the correct answer? The dates. Dates, okay, yeah. Oh, she's not really. She would be very old if she has <laughs> from 1857 to 2004. Yes, I think that, that would be difficult. Would anybody like to tell me why they think B is not possibly the right answer? This is a bit more difficult. Yeah. Beirut, well done, Celine. Yes, Beirut has never been part of Algeria, is indeed. <laughs> That's in Lebanon, so there we go. Yeah, so it is, it is. Thing. No, the General Electric Company was around in 1934. So, it's, it's interesting. Um, so yeah, the third one is the truthful one. She really did invent windscreen wipers while riding in a trolley bus, um, but it took her some time before it actually got to be standard in cars. So there we go. We've learned something new. <laughs> So I'm moving on now, because uh, I'm conscious of time, uh, to games um, for referencing and citation. I've, I've used, you know, there are loads of them out there. There are lots and lots of um, games around using referencing. There are lots of games around deciding about plagiarism and who's guilty and who's not. So two little plagiarism games down there. <coughs> I do a game called 
jail or freedom where I get people I put scenarios up and people have to stand up or sit down if you want to play jail or freedom it's freely available on author stream on my author stream page and you can do that um, another one is goblin threat where you can go around and have a look in there but there's some other things I've, I've also got a game called the missing link whereby um, you have the elements of a reference and you take one bit away from each group that has it and they have to say why that would mean they wouldn't be able to find the information and that kind that they need and that kind of ties in with the idea of getting across to school students that you're not referencing to avoid plagiarism you're referencing because you want other people to be able to find the work you refer to and you can actually um, look on it yes i can i can certainly send some links to the to the games that's not a problem on that um, the top one, and also you'll get a copy of the slides as well, and they have actually got links in the notes that go with it. Um, you'll see up there, there's another one where I've got kids actually holding up cards. And I do this quite often, that whereby I give them a whole pack of elements of reference, not all of which are relevant, and then they can... Um, they can uh, actually put them in the right order but they do that in front of their classmates and so if the classmates think they haven't got it right they can come up and move them physically around as well and obviously if you've got um, the title and it needs to be in italics then the person holding up the title one has to lean over to the side to show things that are in italics so that's quite quite fun and then these funny little cubes that are up there are in our are, are discovery i I actually made um, through a company and they're called Talking Tiles. The company's called TTS, T for T, TTS for sugar. And um, they basically, they interlink with each other. And what they do is they, you see, you could write on them, like one of them says author in it, you record on it to say what information you have to include for an author. Then you do the same for date and, and so on. And then what they have to do is to have their piece of um, literature they've got in front of them and they write with a, um, a, a pen that can be wiped off the different elements of the reference and then they can be played back in order. They can re-record that and play it back. So it's just a fun way of doing it, really. And again, a group activity that I think is really important. So talking of group activities, this is another one from my author stream. I'd like to point out this is not author date. Um, this is um, where you've got the, the date at the end. So I'll give you a clue for that. But if you'd all like, uh, this might be taking a risk. I don't know whether this will cause chaos but on Zoom because of the time lag. But if you want, you can all unmute and shout out the answers. OK, so, oh, no, I've got the wrong one. There we go. OK, so here we go. These are going to fly down in the right order. So unmute if you want to and shout out what comes first. Surname. Surname, <laughs> right, let's go for that. There we go, surname. What's next? Initials. And then? Yeah. 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 No, we're not doing author date. We're doing the other one. Title of the book. Title of the book. There we go. And next. Place of publication. And then. Publisher. And finally. Yeah. Date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. And then that kind of then gives us a little thing. So this is game is a great game to play when you've got a big class or something like that, because you can get them all to shout out. And the thing is, that if they get it wrong, it, it doesn't really matter because nobody will hear them. And um, and it sort of gets over the shyness as well. So, yeah, well done indeed. That was good. And I usually give them an example to just say, look, remember the, public, the punctuation on that. So we come now to the, the writing up side of it. And again, this is something that they're, they're not really very sure about. So I've got some games that I play to try and get them around the whole idea of writing up a piece of work in academic style. Now, the little posters in the middle with the owls on them uh, are something that I devised for primary schools, which is taking you through the process of finding, evaluating, writing and reviewing.
And by using the little owls and counting the stars that they've got on their stomachs, you can kind of work out exactly, you know, what order they should be in. But the writing up helps them to structure what they're, what they're writing. And the review, because they've got to get the words in the right order, and the review, because there's a deliberate mistake built in, allows them to go back and actually do it. Yes, the, the referencing style, I'll just respond to that in chat. The, the, the way in which that exercise works depends on the referencing style. And if you go to my AuthorStream site, you will see that that exercise is both in Harvard and um, in MLA type. Um, referencing as well so you've got both things on there and there's also a little game about opposite and um, an ibid as well on there um, so back to the construction one of the things that students are really bad at is time management so some of you may have come across the game on the internet of big rocks and little rocks where in order to sort out your work properly you need to put big things in first and then do the little tasks afterwards. And these little play balls that you can see on the top right, what I do is I get a bucket or two buckets and I invite a student up to the front and they've all got tasks on them um, and they're tasks that they have to complete. They're really important. But what I do is I place that I get them to place the big balls on top of a bucket that's got a load of small beads in it which is, represents all the things that you do, like staring out the window and playing on your phone and all the rest of it that's there. And then, of course, they try and put the big balls on top of them and it doesn't fit into the bucket. The lid won't go on. So I then get a second empty bucket, invite a student up to come and sort out the other student's life. And, of course, the idea is if you put the big things in first, and you then tip all the small things in, it all fits perfectly into the bucket and you can put the lid on. And that shows a little bit of ideas about time management, how you have to manage all the things that are going in your, on in your life. And as a teenager, there's so much that is a really good exercise. Another thing that I did was to invent a jigsaw puzzle. And some of you may have seen this because I did take it to Lilac one year. And on this, it's about construction and it's about the emotions you feel about, you know, the enormity of the task when you open the lid, then putting it together when you don't know what the final picture looks like. You know, it's just a, a, an essay about how to write an essay that comes up when you complete the puzzle. And it's also about the frustration if you think something goes somewhere, but it doesn't, it goes somewhere else. These are all things that happen when you try and write up a piece of academic work and getting that idea over to students again, the resilience that they need about it is really important. And then we come on to describing things because everybody likes a story. You know, we all love having a story told to us and students think that when you do academic writing, it has to be very different. It can't be that you can't use your own voice. You have to write in a very structured way and you have to be very sensible and so on. Whereas actually I say to them, well, the most readable articles you find are the ones where it actually leads you through from concept to concept. So I've got a couple of things up here. I know Andy's a great fan of sock puppets. I think sock puppets are brilliant because you can take a concept that you want to explain in your essay. And if the argument is between a pink zebra and a green snake, it, you know, it becomes much more fun to do. GCSE students don't really get that because they're far too sophisticated. But by the sixth form, they're getting back into their inner child again and they absolutely love it. And I've had some great examples of things to do with climate change being um, discussed by, by sock puppets. And what it's capturing is that reflective writing that we're looking for, not the narrative that they've been so schooled in for passing their exams. And similarly, the kind of purpley blob thing that's up the top there is actually a fig and it stands for a fantastic little app called Figment. And what Figment allows you to do is to attach a photograph to reality so that you can walk into that photograph. Now, if you imagine you were doing a, um, a, an essay on environmental issues or something and you had a river that depicted a load of pollution around it, maybe the trees around it were dying, maybe you, know, you could see clues in the countryside. 
how fantastic if you could actually take a picture of that and then you could be in your classroom or whatever and step into that photograph using um, your app on your phone just walk into it and look around you and see all the things that were going on and capture that discussion that you were actually having with your classmates because you can put this on a tablet so everybody can walk in together and you can all see it and that that's what i think is fantastic it can invoke that discussion and another thing that i do is that i've, I've done a game for and which i'm going to be presenting at lilac is how we can take information literacy concepts and we can tag those onto the um, UN um, sustainable goals. So I'm going to be doing a session on that at Lilac. So if anybody wants to come along and actually play that game for real, then, then please do. Um, and uh, um, hopefully you'll enjoy it. So I want to just move on to playing a little game, obviously, for evaluation. So this is something where you know, students look up Roger's thesaurus and they think that they should be writing using this kind of language because it's an academic essay. So have a look at that and see if you can de rogify it and um, tell me what that's really explaining. <laughs> or you can unmute and shout if you like. I don't care. <laughs> Is it the teacher man to fish? It is teacher man to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. And that, and you know, but this is something which was coined up by somebody at Coventry University. I think one of the lecturers at Coventry University came up with it, and and said, "This is what students do. They just look up alternative words in in Roger's thesaurus, and he he, he did have it as Roger. There is another wonderful example which is called sinister bottoms." <laughs> which is actually uh, left behind, but <laughs> it comes up with sinister bottoms instead. So, yeah, so be aware of that. You may find that in, in some of your students. And finally, um, I just want to look really at some of the things that I have used to, to anchor this kind of learning, because it's all very well doing the practice, but I think, you know, we get asked and tasked with saying, look, where is the theory behind this? Where does it come from? And some of the models that I use um, are for technology, looking at whether it's just a substitute and a gimmick for something we could just do ordinarily, whether it's just augmentation. So if I give you an example of um, like a Word document, if you're something up on a computer, that would be substitution. It's no different to how you'd write it. You've just typed it. Augmentation is where you might um, put things in uh, bold or italics or different colours or something like that. You're augmenting the text. Slightly harder to do in real life. Modification is the bit where you can move paragraphs around and do different things with it. That would be much more difficult if it was in real life because you'd have to cut things up and stick them or staple them. And redefinition is where you actually take that document and you start putting links to other things in it things that you couldn't possibly do if you had just written it. So that, that's the idea of summer. It's, there are, you know, pros and cons of it. But there's also, for game design, a magic circle model, which is also about the, the kind of when you're actually doing it, you know, is it enabling understanding? Do you get that group response and, and things? And are you able then to modify how you go about it as you play the game? And then there's the mechanics of the game itself in terms of its appeal. You know, is it going to be engaging? Are people going to want to play it? So all of that becomes very important when we're doing game based learning or gamification. And all of this you'll be delighted to hear is if you buy a copy of my book, or if you haven't already, um, called Playing Games in the Library that was published by Facet um, in uh, September last year. Um, that goes through a lot of this in a lot more depth. I also managed to collect um, examples, case studies from all around the world, different um, people in different countries. Interestingly, a lot of Eastern countries like Lithuania and Estonia are doing some wonderful work on game based learning in their libraries. And, you know, they kind of, um, you know, they, they actually um, 
are highly qualified people in those in those areas which I think is, you know, is really good. So yeah, that's game-based learning. The other plug I'm going to do, in case anybody um, has enjoyed the session and wants more, um, I am actually doing a, a course called Playful School Library um, for a company called Infinite Learning, who are based in Dubai, but because um, it's online, we've got some international people coming. And I know we've got people from the Middle East, from Korea and from Japan already on that course. So if you fancy a, an international day, I know it says schools, but it, it really doesn't have to just be for schools. It's, you know, it can be for anybody. Which neatly takes me to, has anybody got any questions that they want to ask me? So feel free to far away. Nothing. You can unmute and ask if you like, or you can type in chat. Yeah, we'll do. Yeah. Or somebody will. <laughs> yes. Now, that's an interesting question about the students with different learning needs. Now, I've got a whole chapter in my book, chapter two, which whereby I introduce you to um, eight students who have all got some kind of special need, not necessarily a defined one like um, dyslexia or autistic spectrum, but there's some quite other one, uh, interesting other ones um, that are um, about students who just don't like playing games or, or students that have had a bad experience or students that are so competitive that they forget about the learning element. So one of the things about my book is I've tried to anchor everything that's in there on motivational theory, on game-based learning theory, so that there's, you know, it, it contextualizes all of it as you're going through. And also Jody, really interesting about the HE um, yeah, studies, case studies in HE. Um, I've got a few which are kind of going from um, sixth form to university level. So yeah, that's quite good. And also I should say on the information literacy um, group site, um, there's some nice case studies in there, some of which did involve um, some game-based learning as well. Thank you, people. For your kind Thanks, of Sarah. <laughs> that was absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's one more question um, which Cara has raised about oh, um, yeah. ideas for online classes. Yeah. Now, I think quite a lot of these can be adapted for online. I mean, certainly the ones in, I mean, again, sorry, I keep plugging the book, but certainly within the book, I've got things like slide based games and digital games, which, um, and the mixed media games, which to a certain extent um, are, are really useful because they, they can be played by mass audiences online as well. So if you've got an online class, I think they, they'd work really well. And some of them you can go to and, you know, play them yourself. You don't need to have other people. There's the name. Thank you for putting that link in, David. That's the name I recognise. <laughs> yeah, there's some great um, escape rooms um, things on there. And again, in the book, I reference in the live games, I recognise, uh, reference quite a lot of good resources for escape rooms, including Andy Walsh, who no doubt will tell you lots more about that. <laughs> yes, select members do get a discount on it. Um, I think, I might be off the top of my head, I think it might be as much as 35%. Yes, I've, I've referenced Twine in there as well, <laughs> case study involving Twine. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, well, there will be time for people to ask questions a bit later on as well, if you've got more questions for Sarah, obviously, um, a really fascinating and interesting and really engaging talk. Thank you. 
Um, so we've got um, we've got a bit of a break now. We, we're running a few minutes late, but we've got plenty of time this morning, so don't worry. We've built in plenty of contingency time. So we'll take a, a quick uh, little break now, just to come for a break, um, and we shall see you back in five minutes. So we'll, we'll, in fact, we'll just we'll call it 11, and then you get about six minutes. So we'll see you back at 11 o'clock. Um, and, yeah, thank you very much.
Okay, everybody. Hope everyone had a man managed to either get a quick brew or uh, stretch their legs at least. Um, so we'll be moving on now to our uh, next speaker, which is Rosie Jones. Um, so I shall invite her to share her screen now um, and look forward to this talk. So as ever, um, if you've got any questions or anything, put them in the chat. And if you could keep your microphones on mute during uh, Rosie's session, that would be great. Thank you. Hand over to you. I couldn't work out how to unmute myself then. So that was a good start and probably exactly what Andy Walsh was waiting for uh, in, in terms of me starting the presentation today. Can you all see my screen okay, Padma? Can you let me know that that's working? Yep, that's great. great. I can Fantastic. see a screen, but there's only a line on it, Rosie. Yeah, there's nothing there yet. So <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, <laughs> before I started today, uh, I actually did want to re reference Andy Walsh, who's on next, just because he tagged me uh, last week in a, uh, a tweet uh, where he sent me a challenge. Um, and I don't know if anybody saw that last week, but Andy was talking about his presentation, which I'm absolutely excited about and goodness knows what we'll be challenged to do. Um, but he challenged me to promise to pretend that my mic was broken uh, and to deliver my session through the magic of mime. I will not be doing that today unless the power cuts out or the dog starts barking. So apologies, Andy. Although I said challenge accepted, I was lying, but you did make me rethink my presentation today. So um, I have thought differently and I've redesigned the presentation so that I am challenged throughout. So as I was de designing this presentation, I found these great sets of slides in PowerPoint called the PowerPoint Party. And throughout the session today, we will be having a PowerPoint party, although it's my loose definition of what that will be. Um, and these slides, basically, um, uh, they, they set up a, a load of themes uh, for me to connect into my PowerPoint today. Um, so I will be responding to the themes using my own set of gaming rules. So I am the games master and you can't rate me on how well I've done that throughout the presentation because only I know the secret scoring. So I will be responding to random slides that happen to appear throughout the presentation and I've made some loose connections to. I hope that's still me rising to a challenge, Andy. So um, what better way to start with a giraffe with its head in the clouds is to, um, is to humiliate myself straight away. So it's to share my own picture of sort of my head in the clouds with a uh, balloon modeled bear on a bike uh, with you all. So that's my response to my first slide. Let me tell you a little bit about me uh, before I continue onwards. Um, so I'm Rosie Jones. I'm the Director of Student and Library Services at Teesside University. I've been there for nearly three years and it covers a huge range of uh, areas in higher education. So basically anything in higher education to do with the student experience seems to fall within my remit. Uh, and that can be libraries, it can be sports, uh, it can be counselling, crisis response, mental health, all of that side of things. Um, and it can mean that sometimes my job is quite serious and heavy at times. Um, and what I really wanted to share with you today is, is not only that piece that, you know, my job can be a little bit like that, is also that, you know, I'm a senior leader now. And, and actually, um, I wanted to share with you how I've come to terms with still playing at this level, because it does get more difficult, I think, um, the, the more senior you get, the more responsibilities you get. Um, and I wanted to point out how I'm still doing that and the advantages of doing that. Uh, so hopefully I'll manage to do that through today's presentation. Just to kind of emphasize really the biggest barriers I think still to play in are there. Uh, I think that there is a, a general fear. I'm always afraid of experimenting and, and trying out these new things, but actually um, I think that the fear can be quite helpful and it can lead to a lot of innovation and creativity. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding out there as to the reason or reasons or the rationale for playing. And hopefully, you know, Sarah's presentation today has shown you the, the outcomes you can have and the successful outcomes you can have of incorporating play. Um, so let me take you through that journey. Um, 
since 2007, I've been playing, although I probably called it all sorts of other things at that point, but now I call it play or playfulness or, or playful learning. And I just, I just find that an easier term because it feels less like I'm trying to structure an entire game into the work that I do. Um, I'd say that um, play has not always been a priority in higher education. And it's often seen as this additional activity or this frivolous activity that sits on the sideline. It's an extra to education. And it's still seen as this massive innovation in education. And, and it, it, you know, if I think I was late to the game in 2007, it feels like we should be further along, along the road by now, but, but we're not yet. Um, but play for me, what a play encourages me and my teams and my students to do is to fail and to fail uh, with a smile on your face and make mistakes and, and know that actually that's OK. Um, and I think that that's entirely why I've weaved play into my leadership journey, because I think it makes my team stronger. It uh, builds trust and um, I, I suppose breaks down barriers with my teams uh, going forward. So today um, I'm going to say it doesn't really matter if play works all the time. Um, I think it can enhance things, it can break the ice, um, it can uh, create new ideas and learning in the workplace. And play for me publicly uh, allows me to fail in front of my staff. It allows me to show them that I'm prepared to take risks and that I don't expect everything to be perfect around me all the time, because I'm certainly not delivering perfect. Um, just also to explain to you, play was not something that easily came to me. I was, uh, I have to say, probably not hugely confident uh, back when I first started playing. I found some of the ideas and concepts a little bit embarrassing. Um, but as a leader, I've really learned to embrace it. And I think that at times doing things that are outside of my comfort zone really makes me a better person. It makes me uh, more confident and it, it, it kind of, um, I suppose, breaks down a lot of inhibitions for me. So before we start today, though, um, what I'd like to do is understand how aligned we are as a group today. So the 50 plus of us, I want to know where, what space we're all, all in. Um, and you'll have done personality uh, tests before. You'll have done all the kind of scientific tests that tell you uh, how you all like to learn or how you all like to uh, interact. Uh, so we're going to do exactly one of those, very scientific, and I'm going to do what I've called herd harmony, shamelessly uh, stolen from the game herd mentality. If you've not got this game, it's brilliant. Uh, I would thoroughly recommend it. Uh, so herd mentality is all a, about mob mentality, really. It's about a pack thinking in the same way and the game you play, you try to be aligned. Um, but today I'm quite happy for you to kind of think in your own space. I want to see how aligned we all are. Um, so I'm going to stick to the cow theme that's on the box. And in the chat, I'd like you to tell me what's the best name for a cow. And actually even better if anyone's on Twitter, please tweet this now because it'd be really random. Um, now I'm expecting Kat and Padma to be evaluating how joined up we are on these names. Um, so we'll come back to this at a later stage, but we will be using this at the end of the presentation to see if I've brought you all together as a collegiate group and that you're all on the same wavelength. Um, before we move on, you currently are all wrong because of course the best name for a cow is Pat, isn't it? I'm, I'm sure you're all laughing inside there, maybe. <laughs> uh, so tell, to tell you a little bit of background from me, and please do tweet those names. I'd love that to appear on Twitter and people to not understand what's going on today. So just to outline some of the key projects I've been involved with. Um, my uh, involvement really began um, in, in anger uh, in 2008, and I was involved with a project called Argosy. So this is an alternate reality game for orientation, socialization and induction, the most long and convoluted acronym you've, you've ever heard of. And this was back in the days when JISC funded all sorts of projects in the higher education sector. And you've, 
you could pretty much be really experimental and innovative and they would give you some money to go and get on with it and, and do these things. And it was really exciting at the times, time of, of doing. Um, and this was um, a, a team of us that got together across universities and we were looking at supporting the student induction process with a alternate reality game and ARG in its most traditional sense. And but it would have a particular focus on library and information skills. Um, and our GOSI came to, uh, well, in fact, the first, it, you might, people might have heard me say this before, but um, my first ever meeting about our GOSI was with really important esteemed academics from across universities in the room for about two hours where we uh, basically tried to come up with an acronym and they just kept on coming up with rude acronyms for two hours. And that, that kind of broke the ice for me and made me realize what we were about to create. Um, for Argosi, the main narrative was uh, a Viola quest, um, which was basically drove a, nar a narrative around the mystery of uh, Viola Proctor, who was a first year student at Manchester Metropolitan University, where I was at the time, who had a puzzle to solve, and originally she sets up a blog and to do this, uh, she uses a librarian to help her out, the very handsome and dishy Percy Root. And he was based in Manchester and he discovers the blog and he sets up a website to help Viola in her quest, sets some puzzles of his own. So he was able to set library puzzles uh, as he went. Um, and the puzzles themselves were the customizable um, asset. So we made this game available to anybody in higher education to use, but the main narrative we'd created all the assets and the, um, the mechanisms for driving forward. And you'll see on this slide that the assets were really nice. There were some great designers on the game who, who made some really uh, good looking assets that could be reused across the country. Um, and Viola basically discovers this strange letter that you can see in there, and she's been nosing around a grand attic, and the letter talks about a great secret, um, which is hidden in a map and divided into six pieces, and the pieces are that second item that you can see in the slides. Um, and the idea, again, for students was to find these map pieces, put them all together, and find out where the mystery was. Um, and I was looking, actually, this weekend... Uh, at, at this game and the link that you see in the slides all of that's still active actually there's a few websites that are a little bit redundant now but actually all of those assets and reusable um, uh, items are still there on that website as well as the evaluation of of um, the game itself so please do use it if it's still of use to you but what we did within the game, although the, the, the game was around kind of getting them around Manchester and getting them to understand the city, what we also had within the game were very specific, um, probably, uh, you know, you, you might laugh at them now, they're kind of older versions of what Sarah was talking about today. So uh, there were games that allowed students to become familiar with reading lists and spot odd books out in particular reading lists. There were games which allowed students to become familiar with Dewey Decimal and a bit like the escape rooms that we have now, um, you added up numbers to come up with a number that was the solution um, and, and other games that um, did referencing. So um, you looked for the kind of missing piece of the puzzle or you did a bit of detective work. So really um, good stuff there, I think still that could be used. But, what I learned with Argosy more than anything is um, this project was had huge funding behind it, uh, a lot of resource behind it, and actually it was a massive and complete and utter failure. <laughs> so um, it, we didn't have uptake at all really for the game. It was very niche. Um, and what we realised at that point was that we couldn't be wedded to a formula of what a game should look like. So we were very keen at the time to create an ARG. An ARG is very specific and niche, has a very set um, formula for creating. And we stuck to that. And, and actually that was our downfall. But saying all of that, this is the most talked about project I've ever been involved with. And you know, we still go and talk about this, this project. We spoke internationally, we produced loads of articles because we were really honest about that failure and what we had learned. And I think the biggest thing that we learned was that actually 
you don't have to um, stick to a theory. You don't have to stick to a to a formula. You should just, uh, you know, you can pick out elements of games. You don't need to do something complete. You can just be playful if you want to. And that's what I've continued to do throughout my um, career. So klaxon, there should be a klaxon now. Uh, so PowerPoint uh, party theme. Um, I was asked to add a funny quote and uh, it might not be funny to you, but this, this is what appears for me all the time. Um, so the first people that I was involved with on our go see um, was, um, uh, uh, they're still the, the individuals that I interact with uh, on a regular basis and still co collaborate with. And they've opened my mind to what play can be. Um, so after we did our go see, we, we did a few other experiments, but we really got into kind of conference gaming. And uh, the first game that we were asked to design for was an alt conference, uh, the Association for Learning Technology. And again, uh, my very sensible colleagues, we came to our first um, session where we started to think about what we were doing, started to produce an outline of what the learning objects would be. Uh, for our particular game, and this is very true, probably this slide appeared without the end edition initially, so demonstrate the possibilities of playing games in adult learning, engage participants with a, the conference, and test engagement with different approaches, and the uh, colleagues I was working with at the time said, what about we do all of that, but with robots, and that's where our first conference game started. So um, conference games, there's been many, um, and the first was at Alt-C um, and involved a robot battle. Of course it did. Um, I don't know how I get away from, with my job sometimes. And you may remember, uh, for those that have attended Lilac, that actually we ran another version of that in Dublin, if anybody was in Dublin. Um, but what I started to do there actually was in, be involved with uh, teams who we would probably do two to three of the games each year and run the same version at different conferences, but tweak them based on the feedback that we were getting and the type of audience that might engage or not engage with us at the conference. Um, the conference game allowed us, so this, this um, uh, left-hand side of this slide, allowed us to really think about ob objectives of conferences themselves, what it was that the organizers were trying to achieve. So the conference game allowed us to help with ice breaking at conferences. It allowed us to pre-event ice breaking. So uh, we did a really, everybody probably does it now, but on Twitter, um, we, we got our pre-arrival delegates to start to say what they were looking forward to at the conference and starting to tweet that. Um, at registration, we did a, a bingo card. So they went and spoke to other delegates and found somebody who, who cow theme the game, who'd milked a cow. Um, and then we, with our robot bot battle, what we did is we had giant stickers, um, uh, giant robots where you could place stickers to fill them up, fill their energy up. And you got stickers by doing good behaviors at conferences. So by turning up early for a session, by asking a question during that session, by um, engaging with a particular activity that the conference was trying to organize and you started to get stickers that way. Uh, we had a, a bit like a loyalty card for your coffee, but with the exhibitors. And again, that, that traded off for these, these hotly th uh, fought um, stickers. And at the conference dinner, we had a range of activities as well. So icebreaker activities and anybody who's been to Lilac again might have seen this repeated, but um, got all the delegates to start to make silly and wonderful hats. And it, it kind of changed what we would traditionally expect from the conference dinner and did get people talking. And then on top of that, we still appealed to some of the audience who were a little bit more niche, proper gamers. Uh, who wanted a really hard puzzle and um, we had some mystery um, uh, puzzles that sat outside of the traditional narrative for the game just people could go and get those secrets if they wanted to and the last images of somebody um, opening up a secret treasure uh, chest uh, that actually only about four people understood that they should be off doing that mystery um, so we did still keep some things uh, niche 
The elements within the conference games, though, the idea of it, and we we sued Lert after that first game that we uh, that we launched, was it was really use, it, yeah, really. Um, it, we had to make sure that we were really explicit about what we were trying to do with our games. Uh, that we found that a lot of delegates don't like being pushed down a route unless they can particularly see the outcome. So we were a bit more um, blatant in later games about what it was that we were trying to encourage or the fact that actually the bingo card we created, we created it as a reu reusable learning asset and we gave it away to the delegates at the conference itself. So um, we, we learned to be a bit more, I, I suppose, blatant about what behaviours and what, what we were trying to encourage with our audiences. Um, so we did a few of these games and all sorts of versions of them and some intense and some not so intense. Um, and then in 2017, um, this, this was the biggie. We did a huge conference game um, that actually took a whole new approach. And whether we could ever repeat that again, I don't know. And we did that at the Playful Learning Conference. And there's a clue in the name there because your delegates that sign up for the Playful Learning Conference are already very much in this space. So it's a lot easier to nudge somebody to do something that feels quite wild and wacky. And, um, and they're really up for doing it because they're, they're, that's what they're there for. They do quite creative things at these conferences. So in 2017, we went big and we created basically an immersive experience in our conference itself. So there are a range of playful activities throughout the days and the evenings. Um, but about a week before the conference, we asked all our attendees to bring a toy companion with them to the conference. I know some of you will be horrified by this. And that toy, they had to create a Twitter account for. And 2017 was probably a good year, really, for, you know, Twitter was pretty hot at that point in higher education. Um, and we also had games that their Twitter character would have to play en route and during the conference. And it resulted in some really strange activity throughout the conference. And you'll see some of the images there. Um, so this was done at a conference where people were expecting to be playful. So it did go huge. And I've put a reference to an article I wrote with a colleague from MMU on this, uh, if you want a little bit of insight into what happened. Um, but we found that pre-conference already, the activities that we were putting through were really popular with the toys. It was suddenly Twitter went mad for toys tweeting about what they'd been up to. And over the conference, um, toys were tweeting more than people during the conference. Again, very odd for people who are observing actually uh, the conference itself, but that, that's what happened. So 68 toys during the conference tweeted and there were only 100 delegates. So that's pretty, you know, it's high, high numbers tweeting anyway. Um, and that was absolutely fascinating. And we ended up with some real success stories. So we ended up with people really immersed in this. But we also found a few people who told us that actually by having a toy that would speak on their behalf, they said the toy did things they, they wouldn't have been brave enough to do themselves. So it allowed entry points into a conference that's already quite stretching uh, when it comes to what it, it, it's challenging people to do. So there were a number of people found their voice uh, through their toys, which is, is really exciting. Um, one of the things uh, I would really emphasize though, is that for conference games, it was really about knowing our audience. So I couldn't have ever run that conference game at Lilac. There, there was just no way of doing that. Um, there would have been engagement from a, um, a good number, I think, at Lilac itself, but it wouldn't have been within everybody's comfort zone. And that's not why you sign up for an information literacy conference. Uh, so to, to run something like that, you'd, you'd need to downscale it and you'd need to think about um, entry points and drop off points and, and just ways of people seeing that, that they, could, they could be part of something. So it was really really great to run it at a conference just like playful learning and we also learned to not do too much so 
Uh, we do get carried away as a playful community sometimes. So the delegates are already busy at a busy conference, and then we're setting them some challenges that sit outside of the conference. Um, and at one point during the conference, we decided we weren't doing enough. So we uh, arranged for uh, one of the esteemed toy keynotes to deliver a TED talk and for them to be kidnapped and for the delegates to work out the puzzle of who had kidnapped this individual. And there was just absolutely no interest because everyone was so distracted by other things that they were doing on the conference. Um, we learned that making everything as fun as possible and as, um, I suppose, quick to interact was really important. And again, the kidnap was a real kind of case in point for that. Um, and we also learned that there's always opportunities to for the organisers to make the most of what you were doing. So we, we often would let the organisers kind of take something over to push a particular behaviour. So a oh, PowerPoint party. So why is there a whale in the air? I don't know. So my response to that is just to show you a little clip, a, a little um, photo of this is Professor Prod Eagle. Um, who was at the front there doing a selfie during his TED talk. So all of our delegates at one point had to deposit their toys in the lecture theatre. Secret, they weren't allowed in with the toys. And Professor Prodigal uh, delivered his lecture and then he got kidnapped uh, in a, uh, a video that was leaked onto Twitter. And then everyone panicked that their toys had been stolen because often most of them had stolen them off their young kids to bring them to the conference themselves. So, uh, so a whale in the air might be unusual, but a eagle delivering a TED talk is even more unusual. I have no idea what you're all saying in the chat, by the way. So if, if there is anything that I need to stop for, let me know, Padma or Kat. <laughs> I can't keep up. I can't keep up. Right. Um, so... The more um, kind of bigger scale games I've done, which I really, really enjoy, but they are exhausting and immersive and intensive and there's huge amounts of preparation to do, to do them. Uh, the more I realise, actually, the easier things to do are the, the play in every day. So um, interactions that are easy for me to slip into something um, that I'm delivering, something that just pushes, again, and probably behaviour is, is a key word for me, pushes behaviour, pushes, um, push, pushes people to think creatively or think differently. So um, these are some of the latest things that I've been really uh, doing uh, and you might find quite useful, a bit like Sarah shared before, um, ideas, and some of them are shamelessly stolen as well. Andy will recognise one that I, I thought was a great idea and then we started doing them across across the UK. So uh, examples here, um, uh, our toy game did have a top trumps kind of element to it. It was all around how far people had traveled and things like that. And I've used top trumps a lot, um, not only in conference games. When I first moved to the OU, um, I used it as an icebreaker for all my staff. So I did a kind of, you know, what, what did it look like in terms of, uh, I, don't, I, I shared some personal information around like, whether I ran, how much mileage I was doing and all of that type of thing through my top trumps. Uh, and I think it's quite an easy mechanism for ice breaking, for getting to know people in teams. Um, I, and, and equally, you know, in your teaching and learning sessions, a real good way to get students to start to interact at the beginning of a session. Uh, I've often used the superhero name generator. If you haven't, you must go to it. I'll, I'll share the link later. Um, the superhero name generator, I think uh, the way I use that is to get people to think in a different headspace for a session. So getting them to look up which superhero they might be and uh, they're, they're randomly made up, by the way, um, and what skills that superhero has and then getting them to think in that persona is really quite useful. Um, and there's another one around superheroes that Leo Appleton used to do around uh, people rating their confidence like a superhero. So they decided if they were Ant-Man or Thor and it gets people really kind of thinking in that space and thinking differently for a session. Uh, I've done other personality tests. So uh, today you, you're doing the uh, herd, what did I call it? I don't know what it was, herd, herd mentality um, 
uh, personality test, but I've done a pig one where I've got people to draw a pig and then I've told them what it means in terms of whether it was left or right facing. And it didn't mean anything at all, but it just gets people um, chatting through, um, you know, their, their thoughts or whether it describes them or not in a fun way. Um, for anybody who's not used them, um, Reckit journals are just amazing. If you haven't got one in your life, you need one. Um, Reckit journals are really good for getting people to do things they're not allowed to do, <laughs> which might sound like anarchy, but it is brilliant if you want them to think in a creative space. So, you know, the Reckit journal gets you to tear pages up and gets you to do throw your book around the room at people. And I've had that passing around an audience while I've been speaking before now. Um, and uh, Andy introduced me to sneaky cards at one point and we started developing whole different sets, uh, which are lovely. They're, they're cards where um, basically you set a challenge and they, they can be, you know, they can be really nice challenges, actually. They can encourage good behaviour. So you, you, you could do anything from hiding a particular card or sticking it in the back of somebody's hood, or you could have something where actually your challenge for the day is to go and make somebody a cup of tea who you've not done that for before. And, and you can kind of set up with this mechanism that the idea is that they travel around a space. And Andy might talk about that later, but he did a really successful one with students in terms of that, but I'd really recommend those. PowerPoint theme. I'm regretting this now, Andy. I didn't want this PowerPoint party theme all the way through, but I, I'll, I'll carry on. So PowerPoint party theme, which I don't know why it's sharks in the sky. So I've come up with my own random um, ideas and areas to share. Um, so again, more recently, um, transitioning into a new university, you, uh, everyone else is probably braver than me, but it means I, I try little nuggets of play just to test the waters and see what I can get away with and whether people are coming on board with me or not. Um, so uh, a particular one recently, I've got um, a new state of the art building, a one stop shop where we're trying to encourage students to come in and talk about well-being and, and that side of their lives. Um, Teesside also has a museum of modern art and they were doing these um, huge prompts with the community to get people to come in and uh, think differently in their spaces. So what we did is we brought we made, well, we made their prompts into giant posters that we stuck onto my building and people started to um, ask those questions and came in and discussed those. And we started to talk about, um, uh, you know, these ideas, then getting them into a creative space and thinking about their own personal way, well-being. And just because I've not interacted with any of you uh, for such a long time, if you'd like to answer the question on where does the sky start, please feel free to put it in the chat or on Twitter, even better. I'm not assessing these, but I'd quite like to know what you think. Or equally, if you'd like to do where do your thoughts come from, that's also absolutely fine to do. And um, the second one that I'm sharing is, uh, again, a bit of an arty one. Well, not that arty. This was my attempt at the art. Um, and we did this at the online playful um, event that we ran last year. And this was just using GPS art. Uh, uh, in fact, my hairdresser's uh, brother is in, madly into GPS art and inspired this. And I thought, oh, what could we get delegates to do to get them out and about? Um, but equally knowing you don't have to be out and about, you could just plot this uh, without, without leaving your house if you wanted to. Um, and I found one of my latest uh, Strava runs. Not, it's not a very long one. Uh, that, As far as I'm concerned, is that an upside down bear? That's an upside down bear, isn't it? So uh, it inspired us to ask the participants to make um, animals uh, out of their GPS art. So... So it was really exciting and really interesting to see what people made and some people made really fantastic pieces of artwork and got to know their um, local neighborhood a little bit better, which was really good. And then the final one um, is a, a picture of, it, it'll kill me for this, but he's all, I've also got a picture that trades off the humiliation, but this is from a playful learning conference in Leicester. Who was at Leicester before? I think Leicester is the place for playful learning. Um, so this again was an activity-based um, session. We try and get delegates to get out before their uh, final day of the playful learning conference and go and do something active. 
and this is uh, through a, a particular website that allows you to make um, a street orienteering. And if you haven't done street orienteering, it's amazing. So the street orienteering map for a particular area will allow you to um, do a segment of that area and then it finds lamp posts and post boxes and things like that in that area, marks it up and they all have unique codes on them. Who knew? So you get an answer sheet where you have to finish off the unique code for the post box or the lamp, uh, the lamp post or the uh, blue plaques. It allows you to kind of do a finished sentence. So we created one at Leicester. Uh, and this was our, uh, the guy on the floor is the final day's keynote uh, who we'd managed to exhaust. Um, they also had to wear neon while they ran around Leicester. Uh, health and safety was gone mad, gone mad. I'm not sure they all survived, but we, we got them to sign disclaimers before they, they set off. I'd really reckon, yeah, you're completely right. The orienteering uh, is brilliant to just do with your family as well. I've, I've, I've played it with my nieces and nephews and it's really exciting to get them running around and exploring. And I, I will dig out the link to that because it's dead easy to set up for yourselves. Oh, right, PowerPoint party theme, what's next? So, um, uh, so the only thing I could think of to respond to a, a unicorn was to also respond with my own uh, uh, unicorn version. Um, I think the, um, this is from the same playful learning uh, where the final keynote managed to include all of the organizers in the keynote uh, itself. So about three or four weeks before we got to the keynote, we'd been sent uh, Games Master type challenges that we had to complete and bring with us on the day. Um, and this was the final uh, uh, challenge. And that is me sat on stage trying to uh, throw ping pong balls into my headgear that I was given at the time. I don't know what, I was, I was only about three months into being at Teesside, so goodness knows what my uh, manager thought at the time. But um, Games Masters is, is one that keeps on, um, uh, Taskmaster type, type activities is, is a lot of the mechanisms I'm seeing at the moment in terms of play. Uh, so setting somebody challenges and getting them to kind of share those challenges. And, and a few of the challenges we had were uh, things like making a self-portrait out of fruit. We had to send that to him and uh, all sorts of things. But they, they were really, again, it, not necessarily delivering a learning object at that point, but creating a particular community and a particular atmosphere so that people were willing to share uh, at the conference itself. I didn't win the game. Um, it, I demand a recount. Um, but what I did create, and I'm really, I'm really upset that I didn't win the game for this. So I'm going to show you the video that I created, which was to promote uh, playful learning that year. What's the sound on? I didn't win for that I don't know um but that was also one of our taskmaster challenges uh, and really good fun to make and if if anybody's not made with their uh, iMovies before it's, it's basically got templates to do exactly that uh, in terms of um, uh, the Blair Witch type uh, video itself but um, really good fun something that we could share quite easily and also you know I learned a new skill. I, I learned that I could do something that, like that quite quickly, if not a little bit ropely and um, 
what I found quite amusing the other day is I was just checking that that video worked uh, the other night whilst listening to a radio play with Maxine Peake. And I thought, I was like, oh, I've never heard the Maxine Peake narrative on the background of that video before. Um, I'm sure that makes it really scary. And I then realised I was listening to it. I'd forgotten about radio play. Anyway, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> sure that was easily done. Oh, I'm not playing it again. Sorry, everybody. Overplayed. Um, just a slight, a shameless plug for Playful Learning, though. So I'm still one of the co-chairs for the Playful Learning Conference, and we have managed to get it uh, back to a face-to-face -face conference this year, although there will be online sessions too for anybody who um, uh, can't travel or, or doesn't want to travel yet. Uh, so Playful Learning is in Leicester, the place to be, 6th to the 8th of July. And um, if you ever wanted a good advert for it, uh, this is from somebody at Durham University who describes Playful Learning as, if you have ever wanted to make a giraffe out of plasticine, hear a story about travels with a toy dog or just flock around campus, then PL20 is for you. Now he hasn't got that right. It is PL20 because we've missed out on three years. We will be having three conferences in once. So um, be prepared for that confusion on uh, Twitter as we go. Um, and then just to show you kind of these little nuggets of play work, so I had incredible, you know, I worry every time I transition into a university just to see whether I've got enough confidence to still play in my new role or the new university and how that will be received. Um, and again, as, as I started to put this presentation together and I was talking more at the university, this uh, on the left, that's, uh, that's my um, boss, the Pro Vice Chancellor for Teaching and Learning at Teesside University. And obviously that's our interaction on WhatsApp and um, it's really exciting. Those nuggets and those little bits of play are starting to plant a seed. And I'm really, really pleased that we might be doing something bigger and, and bolder at Teesside going forward. And then just my final, so that we've still got uh, uh, time for maybe a couple of questions. I want to see how we've done on the herd harmony uh, side of things. So your question from me, and again, feel free to tweet, but also feel free to put your mic on. In fact, I would absolutely encourage you to put your mic on and see if we're all united now. Here's the question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Look, as if by magic, I don't know how you all thought to do a cow noise. <laughs> but uh, I think scientifically, that means that this session, regardless of what it's achieved, has managed to make us more united as an audience and more ready to, to be prepared for Andy's session next. So thank you very much. I hope that some of that has been useful for you today. And Padma Kat, have I got any time for questions or do you want me to wait till You later? do, no, that's absolutely fine. You have time for questions. Yep, got about uh, seven minutes. Thank you. <laughs> So, yeah, if you have a look in the chat now, Rosie, you'll see there's a quite a few meows, actually. Oh, no. <laughs> I couldn't have it any more, could woofs. I? <laughs> I'm surprised my dog didn't start woofing. Although I'll give you a little bit of a, um, I did a, a I, I counted up the, uh, the, the responses in chat and Kat's done a, a Twitter poll, but um, I have to say that Daisy won overall. The more, most people wrote Daisy. The, Graham Intrude was very close behind though, and there were a few others. So we had, I'll tell you them, we had Abigail, Ermintrude, Doris, Dora, Daisy, um, Flora, <laughs> Maureen, Movis, <laughs> Bessie, Missy Moo, Buttercup, Francis. There you go. That was some That'd of them. Nice. I'm, I'm sure that must mean something about us, and I'll I'll come up with something that it does at, <laughs> um, at a later date. I'll use it in a educational paper, I think. <laughs> so there's a question there. Can you see it, Rosie? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, Kim, I think it's the same thing, uh, you know, with, with students, and and uh, I suppose it's 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 twofold because you could engage them in designing activities actually, and that's a really 
really useful uh, um, uh, outlook. But if you're talking in a session itself and, and getting them involved, I, I again think some of our problem is we try to go too big too quickly with our students. So um, uh, playful, I think, is the top tip for me. So playful then is encourages that particular behavior, but doesn't mean that they they've lost their um, it, they can't disembark at some stage because I think that's often what students worry about. And I've seen it a lot with library games. There's some great library games out there, but they they're quite um, they're big library games. They usually got you know involve quite a lot of time from our students. And, and I think if you're not certain about playful, uh, that if that's your entry point, that's, that's really worrying. So you can do things that might, they might not, you know, tick all the boxes, but getting thing, people to think differently. So say you're doing feedback in your library, maybe don't ask for feedback in words, maybe ask for them to, to draw something or to um, uh, give them a constraint that gets them to think a little bit differently or challenge them to um, provide it in a different form than, than a note. Just something that does entry points rather than necessarily doing it all in one go, Kim. Um, but if you look at, you know, in our go seat, there's, there's a number of, you know, escape room type techniques that you could use as well. Quick, quick puzzles that would allow them an entry point, quick kind of formulas for, codes and things like that are quite easy ways of entry points something something they can succeed at though because I certainly um was put off at the beginning because I was surrounded by uh, me and the group that I, I work with a lot we do a lot of escape rooms now but I was probably at the beginning I was useless at escape rooms and I, I could the, the puzzles were all a bit complex for me initially um so I couldn't find my entry points I couldn't find my bit where it was okay and I wasn't you know um, it, it kind of amplified my embarrassment at that point so I think it's that entry point and giving them a quick win into playfulness so what's that Jess um, um Rosie and Jess would you mind if we take that question at the discussions and questions section just because I'm just thinking about time no and problem. um Andy also might want to chip into that after his session Jess is that okay with you Brilliant. Thank you. I'm just I'm just aware of time. So we don't want to obviously people might have commitments and I want to make sure everybody gets to see the speakers. Um, so thank you very much, um, Rosie, for a brilliant talk. Lots of ideas and lots of thoughts around, like I say, that whole idea of playful learning, not, you know, bringing it into different elements of your role, depending on where you are. Like you say, at your level as a director, it's great to know that you're actually are still able to bring elements of play and that games and having fun into that sort of that arena. So that's really fantastic. Thank you so much. So um, we will have questions a bit later on, like I said. So we've got another we've got 10 minute break now, um, if that's OK for, with everybody. Um, I'll give you 12 minutes. And so we will just try and make it back here if we can for 12 o'clock. Um, as long as that's all right with you, Andy, are you OK to, to do that? Yeah. So fantastic. Thank you very much. So we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Um, yep. See you back um, for Andy. Thank you. Well, welcome back, everyone. Hope you've all had a nice get up, grab a cup of tea, and uh, move about. So excited now to introduce our final speaker for the um, for the session, and that is Andrew Walsh. So I shall hand over to uh, to him. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll just try and share my screen just a minute. Where are we? All right, can we all see that? Yep, you yep. can. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So yeah, I'd, I'm Andy Walsh. Uh, 
otherwise known as Playbarian, which came from uh, something my daughter was uh, came up with a few years ago when she was talking with some of her friends at school about what their parents did. And uh, she described me as a librarian who teaches grown-ups how to play. So I thought, I like that. I'll, I'll be Playbarian. Uh, so I, being third up today, I thought I'd try and talk about stuff that hopefully the other two wouldn't cover too much. Uh, and I think I've got that about right, so hopefully I won't be duplicating anything too much. Uh, I knew that Sarah would give lots and lots of different examples of, of things you could use and things you could try. Uh, so I've just got a few examples in there that hopefully don't overlap too much. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about theory and about how sort of that can turn into practice in your libraries. So a little bit about who I am. I, I suppose I've done lots of sort of playful and game-based stuff for a few years now. I'm a, I got the National Teaching Fellowship off the back of being a bad influence, I suppose, around playing in libraries. Uh, but I don't run workshops, I write stuff and, and whatnot. And really important to flag up here is that I run the Journal of Plain Adulthood, which is a serious academic open access journal about playing as grown ups. So there's, uh, there's a few issues in there now, lots of really interesting articles. And we've got a special issue coming up in, in the next few months uh, about the playful library. So if you look in a few months time, there'll be some lovely stuff in there about uh, sort of playing in libraries and about making your libraries more playful. So I've got sort of a really long detailed presentation to give you and lots of talking lots of theory i hope that's all right but uh, ah, ah, ah! oh uh sorry i've 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 just been attacked by my uh, uh rabbit that's specially trained to prevent me from doing death by a powerpoint is that a bit you've done what <gasps> He's destroyed my talk. Uh, I'll have to think of something else to do. Uh, just give me a moment. I'll find, uh, I'll find a fairy story to, to read to you instead. And I'll read that fairy story and maybe ask you a few questions in the chat as we're going along, along with this fairy story. And we'll try and bring in some playful stuff as we go. And then when we finish the little fairy story, we'll come back to a bit more sort of theory in play, I suppose, if the rabbit lets me. So, are we sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. A long time ago, in a library far, far away, snuggled into the legendary Pennine Hills, there worked a new, youngish, rotund librarian called Andrew. I've, I've put a selfie up there with him. Uh, innocent in the ways of teaching information literacy was he, but the reals, rulers of the field of Hudders set him to work in the induction mines, toiling ceaselessly, until five o'clock anyway, to read the magic induction words that told newcomers how to use the library. Memorised well these words were, and rarely deviated from lest they lose their power. But as the induction mines were emptied of their new learner bounty, the librarian would then move on to show them the magic buttons to click in the basis of data, explain how they could send their Boolean helpers to bring back only the most confusing and reference heavy results to help them. Despite year after year of showing new learners the secret ways of the library, many seekers after knowledge became lost asking for more help to be rescued from the wastelands of the interwebs. Few seem to truly understand the secret ways of the library, despite the librarian's best attempts to correctly use the memorised words and the specially prepared demonstrations. Slowly, over time, the librarian realised it was time to cast out the holy words of induction and the perfect database demos. It was time to set off on a quest to relinquish the power of the library and to shift that power onto the seekers of knowledge themselves. So before we set off on this quest together, I have a small challenge for everybody. 
Can you find something in your immediate vicinity that sums up how you approach teaching information literacy? And we can take that, those things on our journey together for protection against the unknown horrors that await. When you've picked an object, post in the chat what you've picked and why to sum up how you approach teaching information literacy. You have three minutes. Go! Oh, a couple of people already. Carry on. Yeah, lots of post-its. Scrap paper, mobile phones, laptop. Ooh. Whiteboard. Black light, that must be an escape room one. Murder mystery, I'll give you one minute longer. Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds to finish off because it seems like it's slowing down. And I'll, I'll just point out before we move on that there's a really interesting mix of things there. There's lots of very practical things. You know, you've got your laptop and your screens and modem going back to the 90s. Uh, but, uh, but there's also a couple of self-caring type things in there which I thought was really interesting like a bottle of water to look after yourself and uh, there was another caring one it's a very little uh, little screen to to scroll through uh, and an uplifting essential oil so I think we often forget to take care of ourselves as well in the teaching. It's important to do that. Oh, and your cat, uh, as it is for the practical things. So if we finish off there, I'll move on with the rest of the story. So you've all got your, your objects to help protect you. And we'll move on in the fairy story. So Andrew carries on. Long he saw enlightenment in the fields of active learning, across the plains of social constructivism, crossing the wastelands of gamification, to arrive at the crossroads where stood the wise woman of games, Edith. A choice I give you, she cried. Each way at this crossroads leads to a different answer for your quest. Try these different paths and see what you think of the answers you find. So first, I followed the cards of Seek. In this, my learners played a simple card game to learn about searching for information. And there is a little link to it on the screen there. Uh, working in small groups, groups, I could see them learn more than in my previous attempts, making sense of the information together rather than it being fed verbatim from me. But I was still unsatisfied, so we returned to the crossroads. The next path was strewn with strange plastic rocks and was glad of my sturdy shoes before realising they were Lego. Along this path, I could see the learners were building models to explain their problems in seeking information enlightenment, explaining those models to others and helping each other find ways to beat their information gremlins. This was different to the card games, but I could see how the learners benefited from being able to think with their hands and to express their problems in metaphor, leading to understandings they wouldn't be able to express otherwise. 
I could also see that the Lego wasn't really important, as a few used clay dug from the river, or collected objects to make a collage instead. So, slightly enlightened from this, I returned to the crossroads once more. Finally, I tried the third path. This path led to a maze of locked doors and hidden objects. My learners seemed to be discovering a deeper knowledge through exploration and problem solving. They managed to build their own knowledge as they worked together to escape the rooms that were locked in or to open the chests. This seemed to overlap a lot with the thinking of the hands bit of the Lego path and with the sort of games and questions in the card games path. But I still wasn't sure if it was the right path for me to follow as I returned to the crossroads. So after trying these three different paths, Edith was waiting for me, telling me that I couldn't return along with my original path or move on until I picked the path that was right for me, which should be my game pedagogy. Which approach should I choose above all others? I sat on the ground and started to meditate on what the paths had shown me and what I should do next. Many a night and day I passed to the, uh, sitting at the crossroads. I tried to list all the different benefits I saw in the paths that Edith had shown me. I wonder, I wonder if you could do the same. Could you lot think of some of the benefits of these sort of games and activities? Post your answers in the chat. You have three minutes. Go. Smiles, lovely. Lots of lovely things coming in. I'll give you a couple of minutes and then I'll try and sum, sum some of them up. Few minute longer. Okay, we're starting to slow down. I'll, I'll give you a few seconds longer to, to pop something in if you haven't already. And I'll whiz down and see if I can sum some of them up. So we've got things on it being, being more memorable and more interesting both for the learners and for ourselves as well, because often it gets really boring doing the same thing again and again. Uh, helping with engagement. Yeah, stuff about it being hands-on, so people aren't sitting there passively. It's much more active learning. But also lots of things about fun and laughter and learning and uh, uh, sort of compassionate stuff about making students feel less alone and like they're more 
together with other people. So sort of positivity and empathy and all those sort of things are really nice as well. Uh, creativity comes up a few times. Uh, that's an interesting one about putting, I, I mentioned in a moment, about putting uh, more control onto the students. So uh, students can, what have we got, take an initiative and responsibility for their own learning because in games, players have the control rather than you as the teacher at the front. Working together, yeah, collaboration, fun, lightens information literacy, yeah. Lots of lovely things there. I, I, I tried to list a few that I thought might come up. So there's a few things that I came up with. So you see there's sort of lots of overlap with what people have said. There might be the odd one or two extra. Uh, I don't think anybody said the, the repetition thing, because sometimes you can play hand after hand of games and you might get them wrong, the answers wrong, first of all, but then you learn through repetition to get the answers right afterwards. Uh, memorable, constructing knowledge, contractive learning, think with your hands, creative. I, I don't, there was some on the, on the side of things about, uh, I suppose being compassionate towards learners, but I don't think anybody touched on safe. Uh, often, often playful type approaches to to teaching and learning are safe for the learners to try different things, safe for the learners to fail, and it doesn't matter that they fail because the whole point of games and play is that you just try again. Failure isn't an end point it's just uh one point along the learning process so you can fail safely it's a very safe way to try new things and to try to explore ideas so how to say i think that largely matches up oh and that's one stone in jess feel a fear of failure in there as well so we'll jump back into the story. Now we've thought about some of the benefits of these sort of approaches. And where are we? There we are. There's Whimsy the Play Fairy. So as we're sat pondering these benefits and pondering what the uh, what the right approach for me might be, uh, I slowly became aware of being watched just off the path. In the grass between the former route uh, that the signpost was pointing towards, sat Whimsy, the play fairy. Why have you been sat there so long? She asked. Well, I explained my predicament to her and she laughed. <laughs> Silly librarian, she said. Play is your answer, not games. As she explained, I realised that Lego or simple games like card games or escape rooms or whatever approach weren't really an answer in themselves. The different games, the different approaches all had benefits, but the real power in using these sort of things lay with play. To truly realise the full benefits of all of them, the activities themselves were less important than the opportunities for my seekers of knowledge to feel free to play. That was what made them so different to my old ways of teaching. It was giving up some of my power to the learners, giving them a safe space to make mistakes and to try new things, to give them permission to start playing. The real answer was not to follow any one of the paths that Edith had shown me, but to recognise that the answer was in the fields that connected them all, to allow play into my teaching, not to follow any particular set path to any correct answer. Satisfied at last, I stepped off the path, following whimsy into the freedom between the correct answers and discovering new ways to teach, enlighten and empower my students. I'm lost in the play fields now. Why not join me? That's the end of my little story, my little fairy story. Hopefully the fierce rabbit will let me come back to a few more traditional slides uh, where I can sort of unpick a few things that we've, uh, that we've illustrated there. 
And first of all, uh, I thought I'd throw in sneaky cards just because it was mentioned before by Rosie. And that wasn't one of the examples in the fairy story. So I'll just briefly explain how I've used uh, sneaky cards type ideas before we move on to the bit of the, uh, the theoretical stuff. So I popped a link in the chat to the proper sneaky cards, which is a, I think it's described as a game, uh, but it's a playful experience uh, that you can buy off you know, from any game shop or Amazon or whatever uh, that sets challenges for people to do. And the idea is you register a pack, you can then give out these cards and they're little playful challenges like uh, uh, lie down in public somewhere until somebody asks you what you're doing and then give them the card and you carry on along your, your business. So lots of little playful challenges. And inspired by that, I've tried using these sort of challenge card ideas in a few different ways. Uh, so I think it's quite a simple but very playful idea rather than being a proper game as such in its own right. So I tried it around the office, first of all, which had mixed success because we complain a lot that people don't I suppose communicate a lot uh, across teams so people sit in their own little teams sit in their own little offices and they often don't talk from one uh, to people in different teams or have a lot of I suppose social interactions with them in any way so I came up with a set of different challenge cards where they had to interact with people from different teams. Things like uh, bake a cake and leave it on somebody else's desk or uh, wish someone a happy unbirthday if it's not their birthday today. Uh, things that would involve actually walking into another office and interacting with somebody in some way. Hopefully a low risk, nice and easy, comfortable way, but interacting in some way. And one Sunday I came into work and went round all the offices uh, in, in, in our sort of general IT and library environment and left these challenge cards on the desk to see if people would pick them up and interact across, across, uh, across teams. And maybe a dozen, two dozen people interacted in some way. So we got a little bit of extra interaction going on. What's been more successful is using it in, uh, I almost said student inductions, but they're not inductions, in, in student, uh, the f stu with students in their first couple of weeks at university. Uh, uh, my particular university, we, we've got something called Flying Start that we introduced a few years ago, which is all about getting students to feel like they belong on campus, uh, feel like they own the space to a certain extent, and to set them up with expectations of how they might behave at university. So they they get, get kept quite busy in the first couple of weeks, uh, sometimes nine to five in the day. So they get the idea that it's a full-time job coming to university, uh, just because they haven't got a lecture scheduled for a particular slot doesn't mean they shouldn't be studying uh, but also they want them to do lots of stuff together want them to form those social links with each other so uh, lots of these flying start people across the university have been using my challenge cards up to the pandemic uh, where we set them little fun challenges to do uh, as pairs across the campus. So things that got them into different buildings, like find where the cafe is in such and such a building, or take a selfie uh, at the canal, or uh, form a team with others and see how uh, who can fly a paper plane the furthest. Uh, I thought when we launched this the first year, that I was going to get in serious trouble for it because one of the challenges was to go to the highest point on campus and to take a selfie to sort of prove they've done it. Uh, the highest point on campus is on one side of the central services building where the library is, uh, which goes up to, I don't know, something like 14, 15 floors. 
the other side of this building stops at floor seven, where the vice chancellor's suite is. So it's where the vice chancellors, pro vice chancellors, etc., live. So it's the very important bit that you really mustn't go and muck about in. Uh, one of my groups went up the wrong lift and went up to floor seven and thought that was the highest point and posted a selfie with the vice chancellor to meet the challenge. <laughs> Luckily, he was uh, he took it well uh, and uh, and didn't react badly to it at all. But so things can go unexpectedly wrong with challenges. But this has gone down really well with with uh, with people during the flying start. Lots of different ways of uh, of getting permission to do things around campus that they might not otherwise do. Helps them form links with each other and helps them feel like they can do stuff on campus, that places aren't scary to go into, but that these different buildings, these different spaces on campus belong to them. So that, that was a couple of my sort of sneaky card type challenges that I've done over the last few years. So moving on to a tiny bit of theory, I suppose. Uh, I don't want to talk about this too much, but I thought it was really interesting to, to say what I mean by play, because uh, I, I, dragged this, I dragged this slide in during the gap, because I don't think anyone's really pinned this down out of the other two speakers. So I thought I'd say what I mean by play. And if you want to read the second quote out of these, that play is apparently purposeless, uh, so it's done for its own sake, you know, there doesn't have to be a reason behind it. It's voluntary, you can't force people to play. People get inherently attracted to play, we want to play. And when we're playing, we get sort of a, a certain amount of freedom of, from time. And it's less important who we are, there's that diminished consciousness of self. So it's quite easy to see things from different points of view and to step into different roles while we're doing it. Uh, definite uh, opportunity to improvise while we do it. And people tend to want to carry on play. So I, I tend to think play has those sort of attributes. And that's what I'm trying to set up when I'm set up these sort of playful type experiences. Uh, so I don't get uh, knickers too much in the twist about the uh, definitions of things like play, but this is sort of generally what I mean. And you sometimes hear people talk about the magic circle of play. So when you're playing, you step into the, like, this different world where these sort of characteristics take effect. So uh, that's the sort of thing that I'm trying to set up when I set up those sort of different uh, different types of games, and different types of playful experiences. Uh, the game itself is less important than that opportunity to play. That I hope makes sense to people. So often when we talk about games, we tend to have ideas of them being quite fixed and different ways of doing it. And we get, <laughs> in fact, I've seen people use some of my games and get quite upset when the students don't do what they expected them to do in the game. But play is all about them being having that opportunity to improvise and adapt and to do things for their own sake. So oh yeah, I'll just click open the chat while I was saying that. So yeah, so that's that's really relevant what Jody Jess and Server have posted in the chat there. So as I was saying, there's, there's, in terms of a practical point of view in implementing play into your teaching, I think it's quite dangerous to think I will do a game. This game is the right way of introducing it into my teaching and then everything will work. The power lies in trying to set up situations that successfully give learners that sort of permission to play. And I've linked to a journal article where uh, waffle on about it in serious ways but it's all about allowing learners to play even if that's slightly different to the way that you're expecting them to do uh, so even if they don't follow the rules of your game that's not a reason to be upset if they don't follow your rules but find new rules that work for them that shows it's working or it, it does in my opinion because Bernie de Coven used to say that sort of in a games community, 
the people that run the games choose the players. So think of things like formal sports. You pick the best footballer to be on your team. But in a play community, the players adapt the game to suit themselves. And that's what I'm trying to set up. I'm trying to set up play communities, uh, playful pedagogies, where the learners can be invited to start playing. And then they start to have a lot more control over things and start to you start to get a lot more power and a lot more impact in your playful teaching. Uh, while I think of it as well, somebody earlier on asked about uh, asked about you know if, if some of your learners have specific or additional needs of some sort, how do you make uh, these sort of playful learning experience work for them? And that's part of where the power of play lies, because even with really simple card games, really simple games that I've used, as long as I can set it up right so people feel like they have permission to change the rules, feel like they have permission to genuinely play, it gives a real opportunity for people to adapt those games, those learning situations, so it works for them. So it, it, it plays inherently accessible if we do it right. So I just thought I'd mention that in passing there. So there is lots of different ways in which we can give permission to play. And I've got loads of them in my the, uh, uh, the article there. But some of the real basic things that, that, uh, that you can do really easily in information literacy teaching is first of all, to show that you're willing to play yourself. So, uh, Rosie was talking about how it can sometimes be difficult to play when you're in a situation of authority. That can sometimes be you in the classroom. You, you're the authority figure as the librarian who knows all. Uh, but when you show you're willing to play yourself, that can show that it's acceptable for lots of people. Those are your places like universities. It's, you can use authority like this is a serious journal article to show it works. So uh, I've had a fair bit to do with education students and it's quite nice to be able to point them towards playful pedagogy type research and show that in fact, I'm, uh, I'm showing you a certain approach that you can take and there is authority that backs that up, that it's okay. Uh, it's really nice and really easy. just have props, just things that invite people to mess about with them and start playing. So if you're in a physical classroom, things like balloons and bubbles and Play-Doh and all sorts of bits and pieces that people can mess about with in the session. And that can start them, I suppose, along a playful mood, a playful sense in them already so they can then interact with your activities in a playful way afterwards and I did mention it before it's really important that people feel like they've got freedom to change the rules but there's, there's plenty more ideas around here uh, I'm just going to jump in the chat and just say yes yeah, so good stuff in the chat yeah, we shouldn't get upset with learners playing in the ways they want to. Yeah, great. Yeah, fab. Right, just checking I didn't have to answer anything in the chat. So I've got one more activity from for you all. So can you lot think of some ways in which you can bring more play or playfulness rather than a specific game or a specific activity into your information literacy teaching? And I'll give you, how long have we got? Two or three minutes to share in the chat, please. Nice things coming in already. Yeah, imp improv is a improvisation is a really rich area to mine. They've got loads of ideas that we can use for these sort of things. Uh, being a bit more silly is it's really serious. It's uh, it's something that's that can make a massive difference to people. 
uh, I did some interviews for the article that I mentioned, and one of them, I can't remember if they were a drama or dance teacher, and they just did silly things like falling over uh, when they were trying to do a demonstrate a particular movement, just out of pure silliness, but it showed that it was okay to be mistaken, and it was okay to be silly. Yeah, drawing's lovely, anything creative is lovely. Storytelling is incredibly powerful. Uh, uh, often one of the most powerful bits of games and plays is to, to feed a narrative into things. Music, yeah, getting students to make, get, giving students permission to make things, make their own games for the class. Virtual library, Minecraft. Yeah, deviating from the script is, um, I'll pull that out from Emma. She says, deviating from the script. I, I, I talk a lot with, the, with my librarians uh, at work about planning properly for a session. And it's really hard sometimes to explain that I don't my, mean having a script that you stick to. I mean, having an idea of what you want to achieve and the approaches you'll take and, and back up activities and, and, and a way that you will approach it not a script because it's often we hide behind those sort of things don't we and being able to deviate from what we expected is really powerful uh one of the things I'd, i refuse to do that my teacher trainers all get told to do is to make it explicit what my learning objectives are because i have learning objectives when i plan a session but if they learn something else, I think that's a win as well, because as long as I've given them the material so they can hit my learning objective at some point in future, I think it's a win. Uh, interactivity. Yeah, tools like Padlet as a way of being creative. Emojis is quite a powerful idea, which links to the drawing and creativity, because it's getting away from language, so it's a different way of expressing things. <laughs> and, and I think we're slowing down there so I'll just mention Jan's last one she need, I need to get over my horror of Pictionary I can't draw to save my life uh, which is one of the reasons I tend to use Lego or collage for that sort of a thing it's quite nice to to give people a, a either some magazines to chop up or some some nice pretty things to stick onto a piece of paper so they get the same sort of activity as drawing something but without any artistic uh, talent needed at all but right, thank you for all those ideas that was lovely i'm going to go back to the slide before i just round off and finish off uh, just a moment, which I thought I'd show you an example of some playing in a library from the counterplay conference. And this is largely a clown from the emergency circus uh, uh, talking about his experience of this counterplay conference, which happens in a library in Denmark. It's a public library. Ready? Did you press it yet? <laughs> okay, hi, everybody. I'm here in Denmark, the town of Denmark. And I'm at a festival cup. I'm at a festival cup. Counterplay. It's in a library. <laughs> Let's go see what's going on. Ah! Counterplay is a festival, but also an NGO, but it's basically an attempt to explore play and being playful across all kinds of domains and areas in society. Uh, so we're trying to build a community of playful people from around the world to figure out what does it mean to be playful and why do we think that it's beneficial for people in all kinds of situations, also in very, very difficult and, and harsh situations, to be allowed to be playful. This project is all about uh, dreams and hopes and wishes and uh, and everyone added um, a turret or a wall or a little shed or something to this castle and wrote a wish, dream or hope on it, and thereby making the castle grow bigger and more real. Uh, 
and it's a good way to talk about wishes, hopes and dreams with people. Go with her. Um, and then the, the Museum of Random Memories is something that we did yesterday where we invited people to just give us pieces of data they don't want to know about or things they wish they would forget. So this year we've had the, the pleasure of having one of the emergency circus clowns, Clay Mason, visit us. And of course we'd love to continue that conversation. So if we at any point could invite the entire emergency circus, maybe along with a, an ambulance, it would be amazing to uh, have much, much more clowning at Counterplay in the future. Denmark is a strange place. I'm a keynote speaker. <laughs> hey. Okay. I thought I'd just show that quick video because it, I think it's a lovely example of play in a public library where all those activities happening were happening with just normal members of the public wandering around this uh, this library in Aarhus, uh, as well as it being the only conference I've ever been to where a keynote speaker was delayed because there was too much merengue dancing going on, which still I find slightly bizarre. So. Thank you all for listening. If I've got my timing right, I should have two or three minutes left at the end of the slot if there's any questions before we move into the main questions bit. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Andy. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions, um, you can put them in chat or you can ask them directly on mic. I'm to perfection, Andrew. <laughs> 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 There's one there. <laughs> um, it's uh, what is an emergency clown? It there's this thing called the emergency circus. Uh, it's an offshoot of I can't remember the name of it. There was there, there was a film starring Robin Williams about a doctor that made people laugh. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Patch Adams, that's it. So it, it was an offshoot of Patch Adams' uh, organisation where they formed an emergency circus. They go off in an old ambulance and it's clowns and various other circus performers turn up to places where people, I suppose, need to laugh, where the world is shit around them and they just need that that excuse to have fun and to laugh so they, they go to lots of natural emergencies they go to places where there's been lots of uh, deaths of refugees trying to cross waters or trying to cross dangerous uh, dangerous borders and try and really make a make a difference to those people's lives for just the, the two or three days that they turn up so it's a charitable organization that's there to to try and bring fun into people's lives that may not see the world as fun at the time. And they do some lovely work. Uh, question about, uh, there's lots of great ideas, but where do you recommend people are completely new to this and teaching to start? Uh, it, it might sound a bit odd, but I'd, I'd always recommend people go back to what their underlying values are in what they want to achieve in their teaching. So forget about the playfulness for starters, but think about how do I, how do I know I've been successful for these learners? Is it about just learning facts or is it about compassion or about transforming them? Uh, so think about what your underlying values are in your teaching. And you can see those come out with uh, listening to Sarah talk you can see what she wants to achieve in her teaching that although she doesn't express it directly you can see there's those values that underlie everything she wants to get a particular environment going she wants to get her children to to learn in particular ways she wants to achieve in particular ways I'd always start with that and then think about what playful approaches could I take that would enable that uh, I forget 
I was wondering with kids doing so much online gaming these days, do you find students find game-based learning easier or more difficult to get into? I, I, th I think this is only me thinking that I find people, I suppose, find it more acceptable to play games these days than maybe they might have done in the past. And it's not necessarily playing computer games that's figured that off, but the sort of playful social media type things that they get in, uh, they interact with, uh, hobbies, all sorts of different piece, bits and pieces rather than specific games. Uh, what I do tend to find is sometimes the opposite, uh, dealing with a lot of university students is that sometimes when you transition to a new environment, so go from school or college to university, for instance, they feel like they have to behave in certain ways. And often it's the more mature students or the people that have been there a little while longer find it a bit easier. So Sarah mentioned the sixth form has been able to play in ways that they couldn't lower down in school because they're much more confident in the uh, situation. They don't feel like they have to conform in particular ways uh, that you might expect when you're new to a situation. And I think that's much more relevant than, than any sort of, uh, as we say, revival in board games or the amount of uh, online games that people play. It's how they feel like they have to behave in a situation. That's great, thank you. Um, could we just open the floor now because we're sort of getting into that discussion um, area now. So there was the question before um, for Rosie, which obviously again, Andy, you might want to have something to say, um, that was that Jess asked, which was how do you demonstrate the impact and usefulness of playful learning? Um, so that would be great if you could um, answer that for us. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a hard question to answer, isn't it? But, um, I suppose for me, in my most recent uses of play, it, it, it again has been whether I can evidence the change in the behaviour or, or the levels of engagement activity. So, you know, the, the toy um, uh, game at, at the conference was quite easy to demonstrate because everyone was being driven to Twitter and we could actually see the impact and we were able to interview um uh, participants too and see if it if it had made a difference i suppose for the little interventions that i'm doing at the moment uh for example the uh, giant artwork with the prompt questions well that's all about again driving students into the into the spaces and starting to discuss so you've you've got a numbers thing well it's difficult because over evaluating it i think then takes away the purpose of what you're trying to do so, so it is a, a particularly difficult um, to, to go too far to know whether it actually is making a difference to the learning as such, but Andy's probably got better examples of, of where it's impacted on the learning itself. Yeah, I thought it's really hard, isn't it, Rosie? Especially that the powerful stuff happens inside people's heads. So you don't necessarily know if they're approaching things in a playful way you know whether they've truly engaged in what you were trying to achieve uh, so i've been quite reluctant to try and show that it has a direct impact uh partly out of grumpiness because because i am a grumpy old man uh because when we're teaching teaching information literacy my well, let me set a name there. So certain librarians will go off and they'll teach death by PowerPoint and they'll teach all the Booleans and they'll have lots of really detailed database demonstrations. And they don't prove that their really boring kiddie session works. So, so why should we have to prove that something else works? Uh, because as long as it doesn't fail as badly as that does, then surely we've won. Uh, but there's... I tend to look at it in lots of smaller interventions instead. So I can see how it's worked in smaller interventions, especially as, again, more on Rosie's side, the leadership and management side, where you can do playful interventions with teams and with, with uh, individuals, and you can see a difference that it makes with them. So even though don't collect lots of numbers that would make 
uh, sort of traditional management happy, if you like, so you like a chart that says, you know, it's had X percent improvement. Uh, you can definitely see qualitative improvement. So I don't know, have I got an example of that? I did uh, one a few years ago, I had a librarian that had never made any sort of uh, online videos for teaching before. And I wanted them to start making sort of information literacy videos. Uh, so we had a chat about it and we chatted a few bits and pieces and uh, Punch and Judy came up. So I, I then set her a challenge afterwards. Uh, I bought, I spent £10 on some manky Punch and Judy puppets from eBay and said, I want you to make a Punch and Judy style video about this particular topic. So it was a very playful approach. No one was ever going to see it. It didn't matter. She could muck about and she learned through playing. And then after that, she made loads of really good quality information literacy videos. So we approached it in a playful way and I could see the direct impact on them, even though I can't point towards like big studies that I've done that say this is what the impact is. Thank you. Andy, can I just ask something related? And Rosie and Sarah, as well of you. Um, in terms of that question that Jess asked, in, like how, if you're new to it or your organisation is new to it, how, how do you convince somebody like you say your management or your superiors to to like you say make you allow you to do that so it's not so much as in the the, the impact or the evaluation side of it but it's actually the convincing to let them allow you to start running stuff with play or you know or for you know for you to be able to get that opportunity to say well actually this might work or you know to try and convince them because i think some in some organizations i'm not saying in HE, but in others, it can be difficult, um, you know, to get that buy-in from people above you, or, you know, so just interested in that. Yeah, do you want me to start? <laughs> so, well, part of it is just not asking permission. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but it, it sounds really naughty, <laughs> but you can start with small things. Yeah that it doesn't matter if they succeed or fail, you know, and that, especially so much of what we do fails students anyway, mm. uh, that it, you can then build upon. So you can say, well, I've been taking this approach. This has worked that I didn't tell you about beforehand, but it's worked, look. And that then builds up your... Uh, <sighs> how to describe it your, your sort of pool of resource that you can use to say well this i've shown that it works so mm. you know this is now my proof that i'm giving you that I can try something a bit scarier mm. that might need wider impact so now i often get people from across the university come to me and ask me to do stuff rather than me having to to say well i'd like to do this is that okay it flips the other way it's not a and it's not an instance you wouldn't expect to say, well, I'm going, now going to turn this into the playful university or the playful school, and it would be instant. It's trying small things that you might not need permission for, first of all, and then building up from there. Can, can I add to that? I absolutely agree with you, Andy. Don't ask. Don't ask. It, it's, definitely, it's definitely the way forward. I've done a lot of that in my time. But the other thing I'd say as well um, that I found quite useful is solving problems for um kind of leaders so um I, I, i'm sure you've all felt the same frustration as me i've been on away days where a you know an independent company come in and then they do an icebreaker and they make us build a craft and and do so they think it's something and it's really badly run and i go oh my god i, I can do a better playful activity than this so instead of it's it's about pushing that forward so if you manage to do you know they're always after icebreakers at a university if you go and manage to um infiltrate the next teaching and learning conference and say actually i could help you out by running an ice you know it, you actually can start to hint that play is the way forward as well um so so i would say you know look for for things that you can that, that are useful and, and something that the that your organisation is trying to solve. Sorry, um, Sarah, you've got your hand up. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, go on. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to say, I think in schools it's quite difficult because um, to actually put playful learning into something which isn't formalised at 
anyway is is quite difficult because it, you're quite un, sometimes under huge constraints of time or it's dumped on you at the last minute or it's it's very rarely planned and i think the key within a school environment is to find the teacher that's that's asking to go forward with this and to work very closely with them but the good thing is that if you're a school librarian you've got an enormous degree of autonomy and as both the other speakers Rosie and Andy have said you know don't ask but what you can do is you can devise competitions that encourage people to come into the library or game play to do with that or something like a, a book face competition on Twitter or something like that which involves playful types of learning but it's sort of extracurricular it's it's not core but they're still learning those skills because in schools we have to be mindful that those competencies are very rarely examined so therefore they don't form part of the major teaching and learning environment thank you sarah there's a related question actually from ella around that about how do you handle the balance between communicating the important content and allowing for playful engagement i think i think that's where you know it is difficult and the trouble is that when you're dealing with a, a whole class you're not that's not going to be the same thing for the individual students that you've got so it's just i think just as if you were teaching a class you would be aware of differentiation and maybe running a series of different approaches to learning during the hour or however long you've got them i think you have to incorporate play i think to do a whole session on play in a school environment would be quite challenging can I add to that as well? Um, I, I mean, do you remember when we were all, uh, at one point, we all transformed our inductions? Um, <laughs> I don't even know whether that wasn't triggered by, do you remember when we all started doing Kefalonian and started getting our, our um, uh, inductions kind of changed and we changed it to bite size and nugget information. And I, I think there's still an interesting balance there. So important content, but yeah, and, and maybe it is the only hour you're ever gonna get. But actually, the engagement and the the playfulness and the motivation might mean that they come and ask you something in the future. So that there is a fine line there, I think, as well, uh, between content and uh, enjoyment so that you're approachable and they can come and ask you questions in the future. Because I don't retain anything in an hour session. I barely retain anything in 10 minutes, me. So, <laughs> and, and, and I could just add to that that you can replace the playful engagement with anything else can you it, however you teach whatever approach you take there's always that balance between delivering content and trying to create understanding and that that varies on your students and on the subject matter and i tend to veer on the side of delivering the basic information and providing ways of them following up afterwards and gaining afterwards because I don't retain anything either, Rosie. Uh, so giving them ways of finding out afterwards and focusing as much as I can on the engagement bit. But the plays can be replaced by so many different teaching approaches. It's just, it just always varies. It's always something we have to take into account. I also think that, you know, that, that, that one of the keys is that as you say, Andy, giving them the, the basic tools, but then saying to them, look, you go away and create, because I find that I learn so much from the students that I have, they come up with things that I would never have thought of, just like today, you know, there's always something you can be learning and think, oh, I could use that to do that. And getting them into that mindset as well, I think is really important. If they can teach a concept that you're trying to get across to other people in their class, then to me that meets the majority of the, the learning objectives that you're trying to do, certainly within a school environment. Great, thank you all. There are a couple of comments um, in the in the chat around that as well. Um, a few people are saying they have to go, so that's fine. Thank you very much for attending. It is one o'clock, so if you do have to go, we completely understand. That's great. But um, I'd 
hopefully um, can just show a bit of appreciation for our speakers today, for Sarah, uh, Rosie and Andy. Um, thank you very much. Um, a few of us will be around if you want to stay. That's great. Um, I don't know how long the speakers can stay, but if you want to, you've got more questions, um, we will be around for a bit of networking um, in the Zoom. Um, but if you can't, thank you very much for attending. We really appreciate um, your time and um, taking your time to come to the session. We will be sending out an evaluation form um, through the Eventbrite. So once you've booked um, to there, you'll definitely get a, uh, a form for the evaluation. And we will, like Kat said at the very beginning, we'll send out the uh, recording with the transcript. But it might take us a few uh, a few days just to get the, the transcript sorted, but we will send that out as well. So thank you very much. So if anyone wants to stay, that's fine. Um, and I think you know, if there's any questions, we're still around. Thank you for organising Padma and Kat. <laughs> That's okay. Welcome. It's been great, great session, and lovely to get everyone together again and just talk about this, this whole uh, idea of playing games because it's such a big area of information literacy teaching, isn't it? So it's great to um, hear from you all and also hear from the delegates and the participants about what they're doing and how they think about it. So yeah, I really liked all of your your uh, engagement with everybody, getting everybody thinking as well. So it's been great to see everybody's responses in the chat as well. Great. I think I don't think there's any. I can't see any questions. There's lots of thanks for you all. <laughs> <laughs> Off to play now. Thanks, David. <laughs> Brilliant. Great. Right. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you.